Um, during that time of worship, and particularly in response to that uh, word cloud, I believe God's sort of drawn a few things um, to mind. So the sermon that um, uh, is... I'm, I'm not, not going to do that. We're going to do something else. Um, so I want to um, just acknowledge that this, this, this cloud of words is very big. And it contains a lot of big, bold statements. Guy prayed it in his prayer that we are finite, but God is infinite. And that really um, has gripped me. Um, and I believe that God wants to speak into that because I believe that there's, that there's, there's a response to that which can be, but I am so small. Even, but this world is so small. The problems of this world feel big to us, but in comparison to who God is, even they might be small, and my part within all of that is even smaller. And I believe God wants to lift us from that. There's a phrase that I believe God, by his Holy Spirit, has sort of placed on my heart um, to share with us and and a couple of places in Scripture for us to go together this morning. So apologies that there won't be many visuals today. I didn't have time in the last 10 minutes to put them together. Um, But the phrase that I believe God wants to minister to us is this, and then I'll pray. God lowers his gaze to you. Will you raise your gaze to him? God lowers his gaze to you. Will you raise your gaze to him? Let me pray. Lord God, I pray that in these next um, few minutes... You would speak to us by your word and by your Holy Spirit. Would you speak through my faltering words and into our faltering hearts? Would you help us to raise our gaze to you? In Jesus' name, amen. That phrase that God lowers his gaze to to, to you, to us, can sound condescending. Oh, he'll, yeah, he'll, he'll happily look, 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 look down on us, look down to us. He'll, he'll, he'll do us a favor in that. He'll, he'll pity us and he'll lower our gaze. I don't believe that's God's heart. The, the passage that came to mind in scripture when I was presented with all of this on the screen was from Psalm 8 that says, Lord our God, How majestic is your name in all the earth. How majestic is God's name. These are God's names. How majestic is God's name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. This was the verse. What is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Who are we? Who am I? Who are you compared with this amazing, majestic, mighty God? The psalmist carries on. You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. When God looks at you, when he looks at me, he looks at at his children who are, he's he's placed just a little lower, just a little lower than the angels, than the the heavenly being. He's placed us, he's placed us at the pinnacle of this creation, just a little bit lower than heaven, and he's crowned us with glory and honor. There's a place in the New Testament that picks this up that picks up this, uh, this, this psalm and speaks about it. It's in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. We're going to spend a bit of time in Hebrews. That says, but there is a place. There's a place, as in there's a place in the Bible. You ever like that, where you go, I'm sure there's a place where it says it's somewhere. It's like, it's like the person couldn't remember exactly where it was. But he said, I'm sure there's a place somewhere where it says. I use that quite a lot. There's a place where it says, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, the son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. I didn't read that bit from the Psalms, but it is there. Put everything under their feet. Friends, if you're a human being, and I think that catches all of us, if you're a human being, if you're a person that God has made, 
then he has made you, he has made us as the absolute pinnacle of this created world. That's where we start. That's the, that's the place, where, that's our starting point with God, is that he has made you, he has made us, crowned us with glory and with honor. He, he, he doesn't look at us and go, they're just like the dirt on the bottom of my shoe. He looks at us as his wonderful created beings. And it says he's put everything under our feet. In other words, this whole creation is ours. He's given it to us to look after, to steward. These words are also in a kind of double meaning speaking about Jesus, that Jesus has been crowned with glory and honor, that Jesus has had everything put under his feet, that he is on the throne, that he is in control. And then this writer is very honest. He says, in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. The world is a mess. God has given us the world to look after, to steward. He's made us just a little lower than the spiritual realm and he's given us everything. And the truth is, the world's in a mess. Belief and trust in our political leaders is at an all-time low. Here, in other parts in the world. We are destroying and breaking our planet. We're messing it up. Things are broken. There's structural problems in our world. There's relational problems in our world. In families, there's more breakdown than ever before. Rates of mental health problems, rates of suicide. These things are higher than ever. This world, which we are told in Scripture, is subjected, is is under God's authority and reign, is a mess. And I don't know about you, but I feel tiny and helpless in trying to do something about that. And then I'm confronted with this bigness of God, and I feel small again. I feel small in relation to the world, I feel small in relation to God. And in my own humanity, if I stop there, I just want to give up. But God has lowered his gaze to you. Will you raise your gaze to him? Will you look up? Because these words in Hebrews don't stop there. At present, we do not see everything subject to them, but... We do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. He came where we are. We, the pinnacle of this created world, lower than the spiritual realm, he entered in. We do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. If you take Jesus out of human history, we're left tiny and small and insignificant and irrelevant. But we do see Jesus who entered into the world and who died in this world. He tasted it. He went through it. He tasted death. He went through death for us so that he might do it, we're told, for everyone. Why? Well, I want to share with you, in case no one's ever told you why it is that Jesus died, because the world is a mess. The world is broken, it's a mess. We know that we are a mess, that we are broken, that we make mistakes, that we get things wrong. The Bible calls it sin. Sin is an attitude of saying, we can do it by ourselves, we can fix this, I can live my way and everything will be fine if I just dig deep inside of myself, I can find the goodness there. And I'm gonna be in charge and I'm gonna be on the throne, I'm gonna be in control. And it gets us deeper and deeper into trouble. The world gets more and more and more broken. We become more and more and more of a mess because deep down inside, we're flawed. We're selfish. But we do see Jesus who entered in, who came alongside us, who showed us what it's like to be truly human, who showed us what God is like, and he died for us. And he took the punishment, he took the price 
so that if we will turn and follow him, if you will turn and follow him, if you will lift your gaze to see Jesus, if you will trust in him, that what might happen? The passage carries on. In bringing men, many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. And this is part of the reason that I wanted to go off peace today. This, this phrase, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assemblies, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Jesus is not ashamed to call you his sister. Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother. He is proud to do so. He is honored to do so. Not because you're perfect, not because you're brilliant, but because he loves you. He doesn't look at this list of attributes of who he is, of who his father is, of who the Holy Spirit is. He doesn't look at all of these things and go, aren't I so big, they're beneath me. He looks at these things and he goes, this is who I am. Let me use it to bless them. Let me use it towards them. Let me use it because I'm not ashamed of them. Do you live your life? feeling small, feeling ashamed, feeling as though there's nothing good in you. Jesus wants to say to you, I am not ashamed of you. That my father welcomes you into his house. That no matter your past, no matter your present, no matter your future, my father welcomes you into his house. You have a place there. You have a bedroom there. We, know, we mustn't look at the bigness of God and think, it's beyond me. We need to look at the bigness of God and say, he is big enough to fix the things that I can't fix. And he's gracious and kind enough to invite me in. I have a really strong sense that today there are people who feel ashamed before God and who need to hear those words That Jesus himself, the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the, the everlasting Christ, the Messiah, is not ashamed to call you his sister, to call you his brother. He welcomes you in and says, there is a place in my father's house and it is just for you. I've prepared it for you. I've made it for you. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who am I? that you are mindful of me. Who am I? I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. You're a son, you're a daughter of God and Jesus is not ashamed of you. That shame you feel is not coming from him. That shame you feel is a lie that he wants to undo and overcome. Jesus is not ashamed of you. It's not to say you're perfect. It's not to say you're the finished package. It's to say that that through his death and resurrection, life has been opened up, forgiveness has been opened up, hope and healing and peace has been opened up. And shame no longer need be part of our life. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, the scripture tells us. So I want to pray. And I want to give an opportunity to help us raise our gaze to him. God has lowered his gaze to us, not in condescension, but in love. He's looked down, he's looked, he's seen us exactly as we are. We don't need to hide. We don't need to pretend. We don't need to put a mask on. We don't need to put a front on. We don't need to put a costume on. He's seen us, he's looked at us, he's looked 
down on us and said, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my boy, that's my girl. He has been mindful of us and he is not ashamed of you. And he wants to remind you of that or minister that to you into your heart, into your spirit, into your soul. So I'm gonna pray. It might be that you wanna bow your heads. It might be that you want to um, put your hands in front of you just in a, in a posture of receiving something. It might be that you want to kneel. It might be that you wanna stand with arms stretched out. But this isn't just theory. This isn't just a nice idea. This is heart stuff, this is soul stuff. Lord, we know that it is your spirit's work to convict us and to transform us and to minister truths too great for our minds to understand, for our brains to get, get themselves around. We know that it is your spirit's work to confirm those things to us. And Lord, I want to speak in the name of Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, confirmed by your word. I want to speak against the lie that any single person here or watching online is too small for you to notice them. That there is not a single person who you overlook or ignore or forget. That where people have been forgotten by parents, forgotten by siblings, forgotten by friends or colleagues, where people have been forgotten during this pandemic, where people they thought would rally to help them haven't, that you have not forgotten a single person. And I want to speak against the lie that you look on us with eyes of condemnation, waiting for us to get things wrong, but no, you are the God who looks on us in order to release us from condemnation, to release us from shame. If you need to receive that, if you need to receive that truth, that, that liberating, uncondemning gaze of God today, receive it and know that it is true and invite God by his Holy Spirit to confirm it, not just in your mind, not just in your doctrine, but in your heart and in your spirit. And I speak over every single one, every single precious soul, that if you have turned and believed in Jesus, that he is not ashamed to call you his brother or his sister. That he is not ashamed to invite you back to his place, to meet his dad, to meet his father. but he welcomes you in and throws open the door and says, yeah, come in. I've made a way. I want to ask specifically if there's anyone here or watching online, you can get in touch, send us a message through the website. But if there's anyone here who actually recognizes, I need to respond to that. I need to say yes. People mostly have their heads bowed and their eyes closed. If you want to respond to that and say, yeah, I want to, I'm going to lift my gaze to you for the first time. I'm going to receive that forgiveness because I want to be released from that shame, from that guilt, from that self-sufficiency. Could you just pop up a hand or indicate that somehow so that I can pray for you? Thank you. And for those who recognize that today, 
They've allowed the guilt to seep in. They've allowed the shame to seep in. They've allowed the the self-sufficiency to seep in. And they know that it's not about them. They know that it is Jesus on the throne who invites them into their father's arms, but who need to recommit to a life lived in grace. Not in work, not in achievement. If you want to indicate that somehow, not to me, but to God. Say, I'm coming back and throwing myself on, your, on, the, on the cross, on the throne of grace. Then let God know in your heart, with a, put your hand up, open your arms, whatever you need to do. Lord God, we thank you that you are not ashamed. That for those who have raised hands or put out open arms or said something to you in the quietness of their own heart. Lord, help this to be a line in the sand moment. A moment where we say we are yours, not because we're special, but because you have noticed us. You have looked at us. You have lowered your gaze to us. And we choose to raise it to you. Lord, for those who raised a hand in response, we give you praise. We give you thanks. Lord, help us to live a shame-free life. Help us to know, help us to take off the masks to come out from behind the things that we've been hiding behind and simply to come to you to raise our eyes and raise our gaze once again to you to enter boldly because we can and if there's any part of us that would still look at this list of amazing attributes of who you are and feel small in a way that is not right, in a way that is not of you, Lord, would you lift us? And would it be an encouraging and an emboldening thing to know that this is the God who walks in us? This is the God who walks with us. This is the God who is beside us and over us and in us and in front of us, who hedges us in who calls us out, who sends us into the world to know that we go in the name of this God who is not small, who is not powerless, who is not insignificant or irrelevant no matter what we might be told by others. And this is the God who is not ashamed of us, who knows us by name, who calls us his children whose son calls us his brothers and his sisters. So Lord, we thank you. We'll continue to seek you now as we worship you and continue in response to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.